Awesome. All right, CBSM, open up your Bibles with me to Mark 12. Um, Mark 2. Mark 2, sorry. Mark chapter 2. Um, so get out your Bibles, turn there. If you've got your cell phone, you can go to Mark 2 on your phone. We love apps like uh, Version, Y-O-U Version, which is a really cool app on the iPhone, Droid, stuff like that, which is a really cool just Bible software. Um, ESV Bible is a really cool app too. So if you don't have your Bible tonight, but you got your, your smartphone with you, you can, you can uh, download those. Um, we are not like one of those places that tells you, put away your phone, you know, all this. We, we honestly, we like it when teenagers' phones are out. We like it when you're on Facebook, when you're on Twitter, um, just to be updating your status about things that God is using in your life. In fact, I would encourage you, um, if, if you have Wi-Fi or if you have 3G or whatever it is that you need to be able to tweet or update your Facebook um, during tonight with things that God is speaking to you about, we're great with that. We love it. In fact, if, um, if, I, if you tag it as CBSM, usually I'll find it and try to retweet it. If you tag me, I'll retweet you to make sure that other people see what God's doing in your life and just so Jesus gets all the glory. So that's just kind of how we roll. Um, so I was kind of um, born with a loud voice. You know what I'm saying? Can y'all say amen? Uh, I'm, I'm just, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a naturally, I'm not loud all the time, but when I want to be, I, I can be loud. And uh, so, as, as God was kind of, it, there's kind of a time before God called me into the ministry, um, one thing that I was doing was I was announcing high school basketball games, all right? Basketball games for my high school back home in Tuscaloosa, Tuscaloosa Christian. And um, it just so happened to be a year that we had a phenomenal high school team. Uh, a close friend of mine, his name's Danny, Danny Lancaster. Uh, he, was, he went on to play college. He was like one of the only college players we ever had that came to our school that played there. And uh, so he, he played for our school. He was amazing. And I got to announce the basketball games. Now, um, I've been to pro games. I've been to Alabama basketball games and stuff like that. So I know how they do it. You get really excited for your team, and then you barely make a sound for their team, right, when, when you're announcing. And so every time that we would score, I mean, I would just go nuts. I, I can especially remember one playoff game. One playoff game to where, I mean, the crowd was going nuts. It was, it was so we could get into um, the final championship game. And so every time we scored, as, because it was a home game for us, our crowd would go nuts. And I would have to cheat. I would have to announce over our crowd. And so I'd have to be like, two-point basket, Danny Lancaster, or something like that. You know, as loud as I could for people to hear me. But we were playing against this school by the name of Open Door. And every time Open Door would score, they'd have four or five fans, you know, woohoo, and, and not making a whole lot of noise. And I would just say, two-point basket, Open Door. And that was basically all they got, right? Well, we ended up winning the game, winning the game to where my voice was gone because, again, I had to announce over their crowd as loud as I possibly could. As soon as the buzzer, the final buzzer went off, we won the game. Someone out of their crowd ran to the scorer's table to talk to me. Ran to the scorer's table. After we just won, I wanted to get out of the scorer's table and go celebrate with our team and stuff like that. And, uh, but he, he caught me on my way out and he looked at me and he just pointed his finger in my face and he said, that was the worst announced game I have ever heard in my life. And all I could think back to say was, if your players would have scored more, and if you would have had a more exciting team, I would have gotten more excited about y'all as well. And then I left, and I, I don't think that made him any happier, right? And so, here, and here's, here, here's what I think about this. Here, here's, here's where I'm going with this. Last week, we talked about Jesus as our great prophet. Jesus as our great prophet. What the Old Testament prophets would do is they would speak, they would say, or they would announce what God gave them to say, what God gave them to speak, what God gave them to announce. Jesus comes on the scene, and Jesus is announcing the word of God. Jesus is the word of God. Jesus is the son of God. But we don't just, and this is, again, all from last week, we don't just leave the whole prophetic deal with Jesus. He is the great prophet, the greatest prophet of all prophets of all time, the greatest prophet of now, of today. That's why we read his word. But also, you are called. You are called to be a prophet. And just like I was announcing that basketball game, 
you, if you are a follower of Jesus, if you are a true believer, a, um, a disciple of Jesus Christ, here's the deal. You get excited about your team. You get excited about Team Jesus. You like to tell people the play-by-play. You like to announce to people what Jesus is doing in your life. You enjoy talking about what, how God is changing you. And honestly, you don't care what other people have to say to you about it. Why? Because you're on the winning team. And that's how we live to be prophets. Now, one of my dreams came true one day. Um, I was living in Detroit, Michigan, and, and I was an intern there at Cornerstone Baptist Church. Some of y'all think I've been to Detroit. Uh, we've done a couple mission trips up there um, with Cornerstone, and, uh, and I started announcing basketball games for this, for this school there in Detroit. And it just so happened that season that, that that basketball team was going to play a game in the Palace of Auburn Hills, which is the NBA arena where the Detroit Pistons play. And so I thought it would be an amazing opportunity to announce a basketball game in the Palace of Auburn Hills, but they didn't ask me to do it. They didn't ask me, so I was kind of bummed out that I didn't get to announce a basketball game in this huge NBA arena or whatever. So I went to the game and I went early and I walked down to the floor and I, and I talked to the guy on the microphone. I was like, dude, I don't know who you are. You don't know who I am. You may have never done this. You might be a professional. They might be paying you a million dollars. I have no idea. Here's all I know. If you don't want to do this, I would so love to announce this game for you. And he said, yeah, man, I got better things to do. It's all yours. So he left. I got behind the microphone and got to announce this high school basketball game in this NBA arena, and, and it was like, man, I just, I can't believe I get to do this. It was so much fun. It was so awesome. It was incredible. And at the end of the game, at the end of the game, in two hours, the Pistons were going to play against the Wizards. At that time for the Washington Wizards, Michael Jordan was on the team. Now, I've always been, y'all have heard me talk about Jordan before, I've always been a huge Michael Jordan fan. So I thought, to complete my dream of announcing a basketball game at an NBA arena, how cool would it be to um, announce like the, the introduction of Michael Jordan? Because I had always heard the Chicago Bulls do this. When he was on the Chicago Bulls for years and years, won all the championships, all the rings and stuff like that. And they would always announce, you know, number 23 from the University of North Carolina, you're Michael. So I was like, this will be, this will, my dream will come true. And surely the Detroit Pistons won't mind. I don't know why they would care. I mean, they don't know me. I don't know them. It's all good. So at the end of the game, I, uh, I, I tapped somebody next to me. I was like, watch this. And I got on the microphone. And I did the whole deal. And I was like, um, from the University of North Carolina, number 23 at six foot six, give it up for Michael Jordan. Right? I did the whole introduction. And people came running over to me. Running. I mean, I'm thinking, they're about to ask me to announce the game tonight. This was so amazing, and I, I'm such a natural. And so they came over to me, and I was just kind of sitting up tall, you know, ready to accept. Yes, I will announce your NBA, NBA game for you. I will. I, 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 and you may pay me. Yes, you may. And so they ran up to me, and, and they said, get out. <laughs> they said, get out. And I was like, well, that was my dream. And they said, this is not Michael Jordan's house. This is where the Pistons play. Michael Jordan is the enemy tonight. We're playing against them. And when you leave, remember, you're in Detroit, Bubba, which means when you get in the parking lot, you better watch your back because these people don't play around when it comes to the Pistons. And I was like, well, crap. And so, so I left with a couple of friends and uh, made sure that you know, no one approached us or anything like that. But here's, here's what I think about when it comes to this. Nothing, honestly, it was a huge dream for me for over this huge loud system to announce my favorite player of all time. And honestly, unless they ripped the microphone away from me, they could not have stopped me from doing it. Why? Because he's Michael freaking Jordan, that's why. And I wanted to say his name over the loudspeaker because I've watched him for years and years and years. The more excited that you are about Jesus... The more that he has changed your life, the more that you are growing in him, the more that, that you are seeing of who he is in his word, here's the deal. People can't stop you from being a prophet. People can't hold you back. 
you will see that it is, it, is, it is not something hard to do that we need to continue to encourage you to talk about Jesus. It's just from your heart. You just see, as I talk to different people, how could I not, how could I not take this opportunity to be a prophet for the great prophet? How could I not announce who Jesus is? How could I not tell people about of how awesome he is and everything that he has done through the gospel? That's what it means to be a prophet. Some people aren't going to like it. Some people are going to threaten you. And honestly, there's going to be some Christians who don't like it as well. And the reason they don't like it is because, number one, they're going to call you a freak they're going to call you a radical, or they're going to call you someone who's just, I mean, you're, you're too, you, you need to slow down. You're, you're, you're too excited about this stuff. But what's really going on within them, check it out, what's really going on within them, they're convicted. They're convicted. They're feeling terrible because they're saying, really what they're saying is, why don't I feel this way? Why am I not excited about Jesus in that way? Some of them are convicted because they're not really truly a Christian. Is it not, is, would it not be ridiculous, ridiculous, if you are an Auburn fan and for another Auburn fan to come up to you and say, dude, you need to settle down on the blue and orange, all right? You're going a little bit too far with the Auburns. Auburn fans don't say that to Auburn fans. Bama fans don't say that to Bama fans. But why do Christians say that to Christians? Why? It's because sometimes they're embarrassed of Jesus. It's because sometimes they're ashamed and they get convicted that they don't feel the same way you do. But let me encourage you, and I'm about to move to the priest deal, about to move to the priest deal. Let me encourage you, as we see that Jesus is the great prophet, if you weren't here last week, it's on iTunes, it's on our podcast, it's on YouTube, check it all out. As we see Jesus is the great prophet, we are called to be prophets of Christ and to announce him, to proclaim him. Now, here's what's awesome, because last week we talked about Jesus being the prophet. This week we're talking about Jesus being the king. I'm I'm, I'm sorry, the priest. Next week we're talking about Jesus being king. So prophet, priest, king. Here's what's crazy. God's whole big design and goal and plan was for Jesus to be the great prophet, was for Jesus to be the high priest, was for Jesus to be the ruling king. The reason that he set all that up into motion in the Old Testament was because his goal was Jesus. The whole reason that he, now think, think about this. It took hundreds of men to, to play in these three different roles or these three different offices as we call them. It took hundreds of priests hundreds of prophets, hundreds of kings, over thousands of years, three different roles, three different jobs, three different offices, hundreds of men, three different roles, thousands of years to just give us a glimpse or what the Bible calls a foreshadow, to just give us a glimpse of one man. It took three different roles, hundreds of men, and thousands of years to only give us a glimpse of one man who fulfilled it all. That is how awesome, that is how amazing, that is how incredible and deep and rich that Jesus is. That's the Jesus you follow. That's the Jesus you've given your life to. That's the Jesus you're living for. That's the Jesus you announce. That's the Jesus you represent. I think, I think a lot of times, we struggle with the way that we look at Jesus. I think, I, I think you may be struggling with the way that we talk about him. I think this is an element of his. I think this is a side to him. I think this is a perspective of his that we don't talk about enough. I think that we have lost our understanding of Jesus in his priestly role. I think we so often tend to look at Jesus as prophet. Man, Jesus is telling you what to do. Jesus is giving you his commands. We often preach at you. We often 
teach at you and we want you to know truth and we want you to learn theology and we want you to learn doctrine and we want you to, to know all these things that Jesus has been this prophet to announce. Or we look at Jesus a lot as king as well. Jesus is ruling. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is in control. He tells us how to live. Follow Jesus. Jesus is the one that we worship. He's king. He's prophet. But I think if we're not careful, we lose a sense. And I hope, I hope you get this tonight. What the Spirit, just, Spirit of God has impressed upon me all this week throughout my study is that, man, that God just, it's almost like seriously God just wants to do some heart surgery tonight. I don't know if you saw me post that, but I wasn't playing around. I think some of us literally need some, all of us need some heart surgery and understanding with our hearts exactly what God is about to get at in your life. And I for real believe if you get this, if you get this, it will change your life forever because it will change your view of Jesus forever. And when you get Jesus right, you get life right. Do you view Jesus as your priest. And what does that mean? Do you view Jesus as your priest? As prophet, he proclaims. As king, he rules. As priest, he loves. As priest, he serves. As priest, he sacrifices himself. Do you see Jesus as just your Lord, your God, who tells you what to do and who rules over your life? Or do you see him as those things as well as a Jesus who serves you? As well as a Jesus who loves you? Did you know? Did you know how, I mean, again, we don't talk about priest a whole lot. Did you know that priest, that that word is mentioned over 700 times in the Old Testament? It's mentioned over a hundred times in the New Testament. It is almost mentioned a thousand times in the entire Bible. I mean, it is a huge theme that we rarely talk about. The Old Testament priests were key to that part of Scripture. Jesus being the high priest is huge for our lives today. And us being priests to other people is life-changing, not only for us, but for the people in whose lives that we minister to. So... What is a passage in the New Testament where we see Jesus as priest? I think it's Mark chapter 2. I think we see it strongly here in Mark chapter 2. As we think, as we think about Jesus as priest, we have to go back and we have to understand the Old Testament priest. Who were the Old Testament priest? They come from the tribe of Levi, right? They're the Levitic priests, the Levites. They are these, these priests within the, the, um, the nation of Israel. God calls this tribe within his people to be priests. What does he call them to do? Well, these priests are also sinners. They're not perfect. They are sinful men as well, but God has appointed them to where they're constantly receiving people. So people would come to them and people would confess their sins to them and often hand over one of their animals and the priest would be the one who sacrifices the animals for the people. The priest would be the one who would listen to the sins of the people. The priest would be the one who would pray for the people. The priest would be the one who would approach God on behalf of the people. They are the ones who were involved in one-on-one people ministry. They were constantly, their whole life was about serving people was about being that go-between, between between God and people, serving God and serving people by being the middleman. So if you see here on your truth, Charlie, if you go and put that up there for me, your truth tonight is this. An Old Testament priest approaches God, sacrifices for sin, and prays for others. Jesus is our great high priest in perfection. Jesus is our great high priest in perfection. Now, this passage might be a little different than what you're expecting to see Jesus as priest. But in this passage, here's what I see. This is a powerful passage that portrays Jesus' compassion for people. And here's what I want you to get when we read this passage. Everybody look at me. Here's what I want you to get. Jesus is not just pleased to be able to rule over your life. 
Jesus is, he does not just enjoy being able to tell you what to do, even though he has every right to do so, even though it is a pleasure for Jesus to rule over us. Jesus is also pleased, now think about this, to love you. Jesus, man, I I hope you get this. I hope everyone gets this in this room. Jesus loves you. The one who has already come to this earth, the one who has died for sin, the one who has risen from the dead, the one who is at the right hand of the Father, the one who is returning again, the one who is ruling and reigning, the one who is in complete control right now, he loves you. He is compassionate for you. He loves to serve you. He loves to focus on you. He is thinking of you right now. How does he do this? What is he doing in our lives to serve us? Well, check this out. Mark chapter 2. I just think this is incredible what he does for one person. Just, and, and, and notice how it's in the midst of this crowd. But what he does for one person, check this out. Mark 2 says this. And when Jesus returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that Jesus was at home. He was was relaxing. He was at home, kicking back, taking a little break from ministry, and what happens? And many came, and they were all gathered together at his house so that there was no more room, not even any room at the door. Now, Jesus had just got done ministering to people. Notice how much people love Jesus. Remember we said this last week about Jesus' prophet? People loved to hear Jesus teach. Jesus was a brilliant teacher. He could spin things in a way that people would understand. He would tell intriguing stories with fascinating twists. Children loved to listen to him. He wasn't too deep so that people couldn't understand, but he wasn't so shallow that it was boring that it wouldn't change people's lives. Jesus is the greatest teacher that has ever and that will ever live. People even followed Jesus to his house and just said, Dude, just start talking. We'll listen. We're here. Whatever it is you have to say, we just want to hear it because you're Jesus and you're awesome. So, so they're at his house, verse 3, and they came, well, let's, let's back up, and he was preaching the word to them is the last part of, of verse 2. Preaching the word to them. People were loving to hear Jesus speak about the word of God. Verse 3. And they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near Jesus because the crowd was so huge in this house, they went up on the roof, they removed the roof from right above Jesus, and when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was laying. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus perceiving this in his spirit, that they thus questioned within themselves and said to them, what, Jesus said, why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic that your sins are forgiving or to say rise up and walk? You, rise, rise up your bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of God has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you now, rise, pick up your bed and go home. And the paralytic rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed, and they all glorified God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. Please don't, please don't let this become just a Bible story to you. This is for real. This, this, this is historical. This is truthful. This happened. You are living in this area at that time. 2,000 years ago, no TV, no radio, no internet, the big buzz going on that just has to happen word of mouth is that this dude, Jesus, is healing people, and he's saying incredible things, and he's, he's saying that he's God, and so you are rushing into this house to hear from this Jesus, and all of a sudden, a roof opens up, and you see a dude lowering down into the house. 
How do you get a paralyzed man on a roof without him falling off the bed? Seriously. I mean, that's got to be, in, how do they do this? I, I do not know how this happens. Obviously, they love their friend, and obviously, they believe not only that Jesus will heal him, but also that Jesus will pay attention to him. Jesus is in this house packed out with people who are following him, packed out with people who want to listen to him. And it looks like, it looks like he's at his own home. He's at his own house, which means they ripped up his roof. And they lower the paralyzed man, Gimp, down into his house. And Jesus is looking at him and he doesn't say, who's paying for the roof? He doesn't say, dude, I'm preaching a sermon here. Why you got to be interrupting me? You're cramping my style. He doesn't do any of that. What does he do? He stops. One man is lowered in, and he focuses on that one man. He focuses on that one individual, and he says something that no one expects. He has not said this yet to anyone else at this point in his life. This is the first time, from what I can tell in Scripture, that he speaks these words. Everyone is waiting to see if Jesus is going to heal him. Everyone is waiting to see if, if, if what everything they're saying about Jesus is true. Everyone's wondering, is it, is, is all, are all the reports true? Is this man going to rise up out of his bed and walk? Are we finally going to get to see this? Are we finally going to get to witness it? I can't wait to tell everybody, I was there, I saw him walk. And Jesus looked down at the man and he said, I forgive you of all your sins. And people are like, whoa, dude, that's going too far. You might be some kind of magician you might be some kind of illusionist, but you can't pretend to be God and forgive someone of their sins. Now think about what Jesus has done. Jesus looked at this paralyzed man who could not move, who could not walk. Is there anything worse in life than not being able to move, not being able to walk as he healed the deaf, as he healed the blind, these people that were, that were just, had these terrible physical conditions in life. But Jesus saw that there's something way worse. There's something far more going on there than just physical. Jesus looked at the man and saw that he was a sinner. And Jesus, with his priestly eyes, said, you know, your biggest problem is not that you can't walk. Your biggest problem is not that you're paralyzed. To others, he's saying, your biggest problem is not that you can't see. To others, he's saying, your biggest problem is not that you can't hear. To us, he's saying, your biggest problem is not that you, have a, you live in a broken home. Your biggest problem is not that you are fighting with close friends that you've had for a long time. Your biggest problem is not that these terrible things that are happening in your life, things that, things that, you've, things that have happened to you, things of, that are a part of your situation, things that are a part of your circumstance, things that are a part of your life. Jesus looks into our lives and he says, what our biggest issue is, our sin, is your sin. Jesus loves this man so much that he first handles the biggest problem in his life and he looks at this man and he says, your sins are forgiven. Looks at this man and he says, I love you. Out of all these people, I'm focusing on you. And I'm not even just going to answer your need that everyone thinks I'm going to answer. I'm going to cover your biggest problem that people have no clue about. I am forgiving your sin. And then we see later on, Jesus then gets to the secondary stuff and he says, oh yeah, by the way, rise up and walk. Take your bed, get out of here. And the guy stands up and everyone is just, their mind is blown because of what they've just seen. They haven't just seen a magician. They haven't just seen an illusionist. They've seen God. And that's the same Jesus that's in your life. That's the same Jesus that is your great high priest. Here's the deal. Jesus is a priest, and so he has compassion for people. He loves people. 
He focuses on people. We are often asking Jesus to help us to walk when really our main problem is that we aren't believing. When really our main problem is that we're struggling with sin. We're often telling Jesus all these secondary things and all these third level and fourth level things. Jesus, I want this, I want that. And we're like, why doesn't Jesus give me what I want? And Jesus often says as a compassionate priest, I'm not just about giving you what you want. I'm about giving you what you most need. And what you most need is heart surgery. What you most need is forgiveness. So if you can imagine with me as people in the Old Testament would come up to that high priest and they would, they would confess their sins to this man, we have to remember that that man, that high priest, is also a sinner and that he had to offer sacrifices for himself. And that man had to offer sacrifices daily for the people. High priest had to go into the temple on the Day of Atonement and offer sacrifice once a year for the entire nation of Israel at once. All these sacrifices, all these priests that are all meant for, again, thousands of years to picture one man, Jesus Christ. Who is Jesus? Jesus is God. Jesus doesn't just approach God as the priest would. Jesus has a perfect relationship with his father. Jesus doesn't just offer thousands of sacrifices to continually forgive us for our sin. Jesus is offered a sacrifice one time and it wasn't some incredible, pure, um, without blemish kind of an animal. Jesus, as a priest, as our great, awesome high priest, sacrifices himself. And as we confess our sins to him, and I really think, I really think that we need to, in a sense, in a sense, live our lives as if we are reliving the Old Testament. As those people would go to those priests on a daily basis for sacrifices and for offerings, what do we do? On a daily basis, we go to our high priest. That might sound weird, and I don't mean this disrespectful at all, I promise you. That might sound weird because it, for some of us, it may sound too Catholic. And I think as Protestants, we get very weirded out with priestly language. But here's the deal. There is no more king in the church because Jesus has come to be king, the king, and so Jesus is ruling as the king, and so we don't believe in kings anymore. Prophets came in the Old Testament, and now Jesus is the great prophet. Why? Because Jesus fulfilled that prophetic role. We prophesy for Christ, but Jesus is the great high prophet, and we prophesy with him. In the same way, there are no more priests as there were in the Old Testament. The Old Testament has priests. Jesus is the great high priest, as we're about to see in Hebrews chapter 4. And there are no need for this office, this position of priest, because the Bible says that all of us are priests. Write down real quick 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2 calls us both a royal priesthood, a holy priesthood. Um, we see Revelation calling us a kingdom of priests. We do not need to go to a man to confess our sins and he go to God and say, go and say 50 Hail Marys and you'll be forgiven. And I don't say that to be funny. I say that to be very serious. Why? Because Jesus is the high priest and we go to him alone for forgiveness. Let me show you one of the most powerful passages in all the Bible about Jesus as our high priest. Turn to Hebrews chapter 4 with me. Hebrews chapter 4. We don't know. We do not know who the author of Hebrews is. We have no idea. He, he, God never put his name in scripture. But he is this Hebrews, if, if you want a book that links perfectly the Old Testament to the New Testament, the book is Hebrews. I mean, it's incredible how he ties together the Old Testament and he talks about Jesus and then he says, here's how we live in our New Testament world through Christ because of what's happened in the Old Testament. It's just awesome. Hebrews chapter 4, look at verse 14. Check this out. This is so cool. Hebrews 4 verse 14 says this. Since then, we now have a great high priest 
This one has passed through the heavens. He's saying none of the other priests did this. This one has passed through the heavens. He is Jesus, which means he will save his people from his sin. He is the son of God, which means he is God the son. So what do we do? Let us hold fast to our confession. I'll explain that here in a sec. Let us hold fast to our confession. Verse 15, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Some of the people um, here in the New Testament time would say, yeah, but Jesus doesn't understand my sin. When I would go to my priest, they're a sinner, so they understand my sin. And, and the author of Hebrews was saying, no, you don't understand. Jesus does understand your sin. He has been tempted with sin in every single way that you are right now being tempted. But he resisted every temptation, and he kept saying no, he kept saying no, and he kept saying no. So he's saying, which high priest is better? The one who has given in to temptation or the one who has resisted every temptation? And of course, the logical answer is, man, the one who has resisted every temptation that I go through, the one who can teach me how to say no, that's the high priest that I want to go to. That's the high priest that I want to approach. Verse 16, what do we do? Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. So what does he say? I just want to finish with this because I think it's so huge. He says, if you get, if you get it, that Jesus is your high priest, if you get the fact that God has established the priesthood for a reason, and God has not done away with the priesthood, God has fulfilled the priesthood in Jesus, if we are continuing to operate based on priests through Christ alone, then here's what he says. First of all, he says, hold fast to your confession. What is he talking about? He's saying, think about what you've already confessed. He's talking about your salvation. When you at salvation said, God, I am a sinner, God, I am separated from you. The only way that I can be saved is through the blood of Jesus Christ. The only way that I can be saved is through his sacrifice. God, I believe that I'm a sinner. I believe that Jesus died for my sin. He was sacrificed for my sin. The priest didn't just make a sacrifice. Our priest became our sacrifice. And God, I believe that as you poured out your wrath on Jesus, that was your wrath meant for me. As Jesus' blood poured out. That was a symbol of my blood that deserves to be poured out. So I believe that Jesus died for my sin as my substitute in my place. God, I believe my confession. Remember the word here is confession. My confession, God, is that I believe that I'm a sinner, that Jesus died for my sin. My confession is that Jesus stayed dead. He stayed dead. He was buried for three days. And on the third day, my confession My belief, my doctrine is that Jesus rose from the dead. So what do we do? We hold fast to this confession that this really happened and we live our lives based on this. And so, now notice what he says next in verse 16. Notice what we had just read. He did not say, so do everything you can to follow Jesus. He did not say, so never sin. He did not say, so straighten up your act. Start living like you love him. Here's what he said. This is so cool. He's basically saying, so never be afraid. Because of our confession, because of who Jesus is, never be afraid to come to the throne of Jesus Christ where he pours out his mercy, where he will always extend to you his grace in your time of need. He's saying, never be afraid to approach God. Some of you have not confessed your sins in weeks or months or possibly even years to God because you got so tired of confessing them because we think God is like another person and we don't, you know, when someone just keeps confessing the same sin over and over to us, we're just like, well then stop, just quit. 
quit sinning and quit confessing it to me. Why can't, you are messed up, jacked up, just stop sinning. God doesn't say that. Every time God says, I forgive you, I'm giving you grace, I'm giving you mercy, this is your time of need. I'm gonna help you repent. I'm going to empower you to turn from the sin. I'm going to do everything I can through my mercy, through my grace. You continue to approach me. If you believe in Jesus as your priest, challenge number one tonight, challenge number one is approach God. Continue, continue, continue to approach God. We no longer need priests in our life because we have Jesus, the great high priest. We don't need to go to a man to get to God. We go to God who is a man, Jesus Christ, to have a relationship with the Father. So here's my question. Are you approaching God? Are you approaching God? How often do you approach God? God is not a hard taskmaster. He, he is our father. Jesus is our loving, compassionate priest. And he just said we can approach his throne without fear, in confidence, all the time. How often are you approaching the God of the universe with your life? How are your devotions going? How are you spending your time with God? Because we're about to talk about how to be a priest to other people, but here's the deal. You can't be a priest to others unless you're going to the priest. You can't show compassion to others unless God has shown compassion to you. You can't serve others unless you've seen God actively serve you. Here's how we normally say it. God must first do in you what he wants to do through you. I think so many people want to be a good witness. So many people want to be a great servant. So many people want to minister to other people in their lives. But often we always try to do it out of our own power. And here's what's weird. We want to encourage people to do things in their Christian lives that we aren't currently doing ourselves. Have you ever noticed that in yourself? I've noticed that in me. I have encouraged people in my life to live the Christian life in such of a way that I'm not currently living myself. That is so, it's so hypocritical. It's so hypocritical. But at the same time, we have to be reminded that God even forgives hypocrites. God loves hypocrites. And God allows hypocrites to approach the throne, to confess our sin, for him to purify us, for him to cleanse us, so that he can continue to use us again. Number one, if you understand Jesus as priest, you approach God. Number two, number two, go and throw that up there, forgive others. You forgive other people. I think Christians can be some of the worst forgiving people out there. And I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this. Here's all I want to say about it. The more you approach the throne of Christ, and the deeper you grow in the gospel, and the more you understand your sin and everything that you have constantly done to God, against God, and how God continually forgives you, you are no one to withhold forgiveness from anyone. The more you experience the forgiveness of God, the more forgiving you will be to other people. I promise you. I promise you. And I know that there is some deep sin that has happened to people in this room. I know that. But I promise you, no one has ever done anything to you deeper than you have done to Jesus, worse than you have done to Jesus. And here's all I have to say. Look to the cross. Look at what we did to Jesus because of our sin at the cross. It doesn't get any worse than that. And I say that very seriously, very carefully, but very truthfully. If we want to be a priest to people, and we want people to understand the sacrifice of Jesus, 
the best way that we can help them understand, one of the best ways that we can help them to understand the sacrifice of Jesus is by offering them forgiveness, full, full forgiveness when they sin against us, but not just saying it's okay. Sin is never, sin is never okay with God. Instead saying, I forgive you because it's been paid for. I forgive you because of what Jesus has done at the cross. I forgive you because Jesus has already bought, he has already purchased our sins by his blood. And so because Jesus will forgive you through his blood, if you confess it to him, I forgive you as a Christian. I forgive you because I cannot hold it against you. I would encourage you, keep as a part of your language asking people to forgive you when you sin against them. Offer people forgiveness constantly, even I think the hardest is your family. The people who are supposed to love you the most often hurt you the deepest and the most often. Sometimes it's hard to forgive something big that someone does, a, a, a friend that does something behind your back and, and man, it should not have happened and they feel deeply sorry about it and you know, it might take a little while but you forgive them but someone that repeatedly does something in your life I mean, if there's a problem, if there's an issue, something that someone should not be doing in your life that is hurting you, you come and talk to one of us and we need to get it handled. I'm saying someone that, that has hurt you in a way that they are truly sorry and they're repentant and they ask for forgiveness, offer forgiveness to them. But not saying, get this, not saying it's okay. Saying, based on the blood of Jesus, based on the gospel, I forgive you. Those are two personal, personal applications. The next three are ministry type applications. What we need to do with other people because Jesus is priest. Number three, real quick. I just got these last three super fast. Um, number three, point people to the cross. How do we be a priest? What do priests do? Priests constantly made sacrifices in the Old Testament. They were constantly saying, look at how God has to judge sin. We have to continue to make these sacrifices. Jesus, as the high priest, sacrifices himself for us. So as 1 Peter 2 calls us priest, the priesthood, as he calls us priest, what do we do? We constantly point people to the cross. That is where our identity lies. That's where we see our sin at the cross. That's where we see Jesus' humanity at the cross. That's where we see Jesus' divinity, that he's God, at the cross. That's where we see God's wrath over sin at the cross. That's where we see God's power to purify us at the cross. That's where we see this entire beautiful gospel. It's all there at once at the cross. So as priests, we constantly point people to the cross. I said this earlier, let me say it again. I do not want us to be a student ministry that is just hyped up, jacked up on only inviting friends to come and be a part of this. I think that's a huge part of us, and praise God for that. Y'all are doing a phenomenal job of including and involving and inviting your friends. But also as priests, you need to be able to personally minister to them. One thing that I'm right now that I've been so convicted over the last three or four weeks that we are getting rolling, we're getting started in our student ministry is personal one-on-one -on -one discipleship. And I'm meeting with a few guys and I'm talking with a few of our girls and, and wanting to disciple them and talk with them about their lives and pour my life into them and hold them accountable and disciple them in ways that they can in turn disciple others in our student ministry. And if you are someone in here that says, you know what, I would love to have a spiritual mentor. I would love to have something like a, a big brother or a big sister, someone that would pour their life into me, someone that would help me with my faith, someone that would help me with my walk. Or if you're someone that's saying, Chip, I, I think I could do that for someone else. I'm telling you, this needs to become something huge in our student ministry as we minister to other, as we talk to each other, as we um, encourage each other in the gospel, as we point each other to the cross. If you want to be involved in this in any way, you come and talk to me and we will get it set up. This is a normal biblical pattern that I apologize as your pastor that I have not done a very good job of leading this as I should. And God has laid this on my heart that this must be a more, um, a more constant part of our student ministry, pointing each other to the cross. Last two, real quick, help people overcome sin 
This is a huge part of discipleship. This is a huge part of being a priest. Man, you see a brother or a sister struggling, you go up to them, you talk to them. Guys, you be approachable. Ladies, you be approachable. And let's help each other say, hey, listen, I was struggling in that. Hey, that was a big problem in my life. Here's the road it took me down. I, it took me down a road I didn't want to get to. And here's where, I've, here's where I ended up. And praise God, it got me out of it. Let me help you in that way. That's a huge part of discipleship. That's a huge part of being a priest. And then lastly, pray for others. Pray for others. Could you imagine walking through the halls of your public school? Walking through the halls of your public school and you see someone with their arm around somebody else and their heads bowed and praying for each other. Not caring what other people will say. Not caring what other people will think. But whenever someone says, hey, will you pray for me about this? You say, let's do it right now. Let's pray right here. Let's pray right now. That we literally pray for each other. And not just in public, but in private. You're hanging out together. Hey, how can I pray for you? I want to be a priest in your life. Because this is what the priest would do. How can I be a priest in your life? How can I pray for you? If God could answer anything in your life right now, how are you suffering? How are you struggling? What are some needs that you have that that God could provide for? Westminster students. I went to a Christian school. It was rare. At my Christian school at TCS, it was rare that we saw students publicly praying for one another. It was rare. It's, it's, it's sad to even think about. I don't know if it does happen at Westminster. I don't know if it does not. But I'm telling you, you can start an incredible movement in your school as well just by praying for one another and seeing how God could use that. Jesus is the great high priest. He fulfilled the role of hundreds of men over thousands of years to be the great high priest. And like Christ, We need to be priests to others by approaching God, forgiving others, pointing them to the cross, helping them overcome their sin, and praying for them. Do you believe in the great high priest? Are you following the great high priest? If so, I promise you, you will begin to grow and be a priest to other people in their lives.